Will Reuter is a fine press proprietor. The name of the press is uh, Aliquando, the Aliquando Press. Yep. You've been operating that press since the mid, mid-60s, mid early yeah, 60s? Yeah, yeah, it's 56 years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Almost and as old as I am. Still kicking. Yeah. <laughs> and within the last several years, you won the Robert... Our Reed Award from the Alcun Society in recognition of oh, your yeah. <laughs> outstanding contributions to the arts of the book in Canada. So congratulations for that. Well, thank you. And uh, welcome once again to the Bibliophile. Well, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, one of your books, is, is it just simply entitled uh, Cobden Sanderson? There are several books that I've done. I think I've covered basically all that I am able to reprint of Cobden Sanderson's writings about book binding and other things. And if I uh, had a moment, I would run around and show you some copies, but I won't. I've done, I did two books on Cobden Sanderson uh, on book binding. One probably 15, 20 years ago was basically an interview with Cobden Sanderson in which uh, he was quite informal about this and that and talking about the use of uh, colored silk thread in sewing the signatures of the book. That, to me, is probably the most bizarre thing that anyone would want to do, to show off the spine of the book when you've got beautiful type. Mm-hmm. And when the thickness of the thread is probably thicker than the, uh, the stems, you know, the, uh, the width of a single character of type. But uh, he's a fascinating guy. When was he born? Do you remember? Uh, 18, Roughly? 1840 okay. to, I think, 1924, 25, but I'm an old man and I don't remember <laughs> dates that well. But he's a, a marvelous guy. Why? Why? Because he really had a passion for books. Was he trained as a lawyer? He was first trained as a lawyer, uh, worked, I think, in a railroad uh, company, railroad insurance or something like that. Went, and I really am doing this off my head because I haven't read my own stuff or uh, anybody else's for a while. He was a friend of William Morris, was at dinner one night, uh, and uh, Mrs. Morris turned to him and said something like, uh, um, I'm doing embroidery for books, and you should take up bookbinding, and then we could work together, or you could take my embroidery and make it into a book. And he had a natural uh, affinity for the making of books. Hmm. And it was only after that, and I think only for about 15 years, maybe not even that long, that he had the Dove's Press. First it was the Dove's Bindery, and he was an amazing designer of bindings. Later on, he got some assistance. His wife was working with him. His wife was working, yes. His wife sewed the books and did a fair bit of forwarding up to the stage where you put on the cover and uh, all that. But he was a good book. He was a good case designer. The the outside of the book was embellished with beautiful gold tools that he had uh, made and uh, really elegant, uh, amazingly beautiful bindings. He, he had this natural ability. He was, of course, inspired, as many people were before, at the time and later, by William Morris and the Kelmscott Press and uh, decided to set up his own press, the Dove's Press, which uh, he did some beautiful books until, I think, 1916, when he threw all of his type into the River Thames. And you know this much better than I do, that he was in partnership with Emery Walker, and Emery Walker was probably a, a much better guy than history is allowing him to be remembered as. And Emery Walker designed the type, did he? I think he had his office do the type design. I'm going to assume that. But it was a basically a design from the uh, 17th, the early, sorry, the 16th century, mm. the mid, what did I say? The mid 15th century. <laughs> and later on, the Venetians. Was that uh, Jensen or not? Yeah, Jensen and a few others had evolved a very nice style of writing, from writing rather, and had evolved a very nice simple typeface that was very clean and stands the test of time. Cobden Sanderson took that idea and the type design was formed, the Dove's type. Nowadays it looks pretty damn good, it's very readable. The capital letters are just too big for the the smaller uh, lowercase height. Uh, and that could probably be corrected 
in subsequent designs, but there was nothing wrong with it. He worked with one typeface and one size, type size only, mm -hmm. uh, sort of 14 point size. And uh, he uh, got a number of people to uh, help with the binding. His own bindery took over, and if I had some time and you could, uh, uh, we could talk further, I would show you the two Dove's Press books that I have. Uh, they're both quite a comfortable size. One is a small book with this enormous type in proportion to the book, and the size of the type works perfectly. But he had very austere pages. His page design was very cold and architectural, and the criticism that many people have after the glorious flourishes and almost uh, uh, oriental carpet-like designs of uh, the Kelmscott Press was that this is very institutional, very industrial, and cold. It's not really, but he cleaned up a lot of the excesses of book and type design up to that point. And uh, he, was, yeah, it was, he was very much a modern guy in that way, yeah, without necessarily intending to be. Well, and it was a reaction against that kind of overly flowery oh, appearance, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I have one uh, Kelmscott Press too, uh, mm -hmm. book two, and it's... Uh, it's a beauty, but you just don't need it all. Yeah. So he really was a modernist in our view, <clears throat> going into the creation of books. His bindings for the Dove's Press were very simple. Even the leather-bound books were very, very simply done, unless you wanted something more florid, in which case you could hire Cognitz Anderson or one of his assistants. Uh, it's interesting that one of the people in his shop was a woman called... Bessie, and I'm sorry, I can't remember her name, but uh, she uh, worked for quite a while for him, and then she up and married and moved off to British Columbia. And mm -hmm. I'd love to know more about that. Did yeah. she disband bookbinding completely? Did she have pupils? Was there anybody who was influenced by Bessie and by extension the Dove's uh, bindery. Who are the pupils of Chopin? You can almost do trace the lineage there, and you might be able to trace in uh, Rubinstein's technique a little of the pupil of Chopin, you know, three or four generations before. But I don't know what happened to Bessie. But I you do know it. her last name. You just can't recall it right now? or just... Bessie Hosey or something. But it's, it's in it, your book. It is, okay. It's in that book, which okay. will tell every, everybody everything. Good. So there's, uh, the, there's the first step of the There's the first step. Uh, uh, the only other books I've done on Cobden Sanderson have been uh, an anthology, which I don't have here, okay. of um, uh, some of the, his journal entries. And I may not have, you may not have seen it or I may not have told you about it, but uh, this was done a few years ago. My friend Don Taylor, who's an excellent bookbinder, helped me. I got photocopies of all the pertinent entries, and Don helped choose the ones on bookbinding. And I concentrated on the ones on uh, printing and type and all the usual Dove's Press things. And then I did a, a final edit and printed it. And um, I'm very pleased with it. It was called Majesty, Order, and Beauty, I think. Well, I may have to go upstairs and look for it. Let me go upstairs. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> I should have been a little more prepared for this. Let me see if I can find this quickly, of course. When I want something, it never appears. Yeah, no stress here. Yeah. Ah, just bear with me. If you saw the upstairs, you know why I was plunking around here. <laughs> it's an embarrassment. <laughs> well, I can see tons of books just from down here. Success. Hey, hey, I just great. ordered beauty. Okay, I'll be right down. Yep. <clears throat> I am very proud of this, and it's uh, probably one of those books that I'll never be able to do again because. I just don't have the stamina for uh, setting type that I once did. Yeah. There you go. Oh, thank you. Oh, wow. So I'm looking Upside at down. Okay, that's better. <laughs> now, this is, no, this is not my design. You see from the colophon that uh, uh, this is actually my great uh, uncle in Amsterdam who did the paper, but it was contemporary with, uh, it was wallpaper, and it was yeah. contemporary with, Covenant Sanderson, and I thought that's the binding. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, he had quite a beautiful beard, didn't he? Oh, he was very, I think he was quite a dapper fellow. He was a rather uh, slightly below average height, I suspect. Uh -huh. There's a photo of him and Emery Walker, and 
Emery Walker seems to tower over him. Yeah. But he was very fair to his staff, as I remember. He gave them uh, uh, lots of holidays and uh, paid them well so that they weren't, uh, they weren't suffering. And I think they really, really liked and admired him. This was published in 2007. Uh huh. So, what about his philosophy itself? His philosophy. Yeah. Can um, you... Yeah, that's really tricky. He almost had his own philosophy. I suspect he was leaning toward Buddhism as much as anything else. He really believed in the cosmos, the uh, order of the universe, and I'm really simplifying it because I certainly don't understand all or much of what he was thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was there was a general ease in nature and in the uh, universe, if you like, which compensated for the dis-ease of everyday life. He was a very irrational person. I suspect he was bipolar and untreated. And I suspect that uh, Mrs. Cobden Sanderson, who I believe was a bit older than him, uh, had quite the road to Oh, he's also a dedicated vegetarian. Okay. He talks about you know a great supper of onions and potatoes. But uh, his passion for books, his passion for um, so many aspects of life, and I think a sense, in a weird way, of fairness really pays off. And How, how did books fit in with his philosophy? Also, did he have a practical approach to bookbinding and design? Well, he, yeah, I think because he did his own, he did his own binding for it a number of years and eventually stopped. Mm -hmm. Uh, He certainly knew the practicalities. There, it's anybody's guess whether he actually set a line of type, but he certainly would have been closely involved in the uh, pages. He would have pages set and then go through it, go through them to make sure that was exactly what he wanted. Uh, When he wanted display type, he didn't have it, so he would commission somebody like Edward Johnston to uh, do initials and then they would be engraved and uh, into wood and printed so that there was a lot of flexibility. Uh, I'm trying to think which book it is that uh, he sweated over. It begins of da 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 and the O becomes so uh, majestic. Of course the Bible in the beginning, the lower, the capital I runs the entire length of the page. Yeah, it's so that is a great agree. statement. I agree with you. Yeah, you, know, you just he he knew how to make a, a statement at the beginning. The book that I have is Tennyson, and it's very beautiful. Three clumps of poems. Tennyson is for me not the easiest poem to, poet to read, but the use of red is absolutely gorgeous, and there are spaces between those divisions. He used blank paper as much as anything else to suggest a change of thought. Uh, I was was going to comment on your use of red in your book. It's beautiful. Each year is is in red. Yeah, though this is very much a diary and a journal so Mm -hmm. that I had to uh, separate the uh, the sections. Uh, There was some very tricky page makeup because uh, uh, I had to be sure I had enough lines on every page so that they would read comfortably. But uh, I think that every word in there is Cobden Sanderson. I think I cut an article once because it just wouldn't uh, work. (laughs) And it was possible. So uh, I would say 99.96% of that text is Cobden Sanderson. And it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. And I did some wood engravings with type as my kind of comment on it. And the circle became a very important element, the sort of Buddhist circle, uh-huh. which appears through a number of them. And on the back of the page, as you can see, I didn't want a blank page, so I printed in very, very pale ink a variation on the cover paper. Oh, no, I see. So that it wouldn't be blank, and it's exactly the size of the page of the type area, yeah. so that it's not quite a blank page. And all of those inserts are printed on Japanese paper to make it very subtly different. It was a very hard book to conceive, and I'm not sure I've got it, but uh, Cobden Sanderson really is a wonderful guy. Since then, I've done one other book called Work and Beauty, which is um, a uh, catch-all of some other bits and pieces that uh, he wrote about uh, type and printing and the world, and that's a very tiny book, but again, I've tried to reflect his style. Cobden Sanderson hated any kind of ornament or illustration, so I had to be very careful what I did with this. 
So that's my involvement with Cobden Sanders, and he's, he uh, certainly continues to be an inspiration. Yeah, was there anything that he said or, or wrote that had a particular impact on the way that you make books? Not anything specific. It's um, just him as a, an individual? Him as an individual, yeah. And I, I've, I've, since then, I've uh, because I haven't printed very much William Morris, mm. again, if you don't mind waiting, I will let you, I will get a copy of my most recent book, which I actually have here which is a little tribute to uh, William Morris. Oh. And here I've put my finger in, into things much more mm-hmm. because um, this is the style, oh, the kind wow. of medieval style, which you can just flip here and it should come out. Oh, look at the gold. Yeah, well, that's a nice Japanese uh, geogami paper from the Japanese paper place, but that's a medieval structure. Cobden Sand- uh, um, Morris was a medievalist, without doubt. I've... Uh, Wow. used um, one of the uh, reproduction faces, facsimile faces, of the uh, uh, Kelmscott Press for part of the text throughout. Mm-hmm. There was a wonderful um, type uh, designer on the West Coast called Jim Rimmer. I'm sure you've heard of him. I have, yeah. And that's one of Jim Rimmer's uh, takes on an incanabula face throughout. What and does that mean? Incanabula? No, case, you said? That's a take. Oh, a take. <laughs> yeah. Okay, got it. Got That's it. a wonderful take on uh, I see. Incanabula, one of the, one of the early uh, Italian faces. And this is based on four interviews that uh, Morris gave near the end of his life. Mm-hmm. I couldn't print all of the interviews. I couldn't even print one of the interviews because I just can't typeset that much anymore. Mm-hmm. So I took all of his answers to many questions and combined them, compiled them, did a tiny bit of bridging material where I had to make it clear that this, that the question being asked was, you know, very specifically whatever, and uh, just made a a new book thematic so that uh, it would make some sense. I also had Jim Rimmer cut me an ornament many years ago, and if you turn to the title page, you can see that I've used it not only throughout, but I've tried to do a Morris uh, pastiche okay. on the title page. Yeah, that's beautiful and colorful. I'm going to get a photograph of that. But I'm running out of subjects <laughs> in printing. <laughs> so you I'll think... be doing something else. I'm not sure what yet. Uh, so you, uh, you've you taken these, uh, these fine press uh, proprietors and practitioners... And you've tried to, what, give them new life? In this case, yeah. I, I'm in Effectively, this is unpublished text because I don't think it's been published with one exception since the texts were written, were, were printed in magazines of the 1890s. Oh, it's nowhere else? No, only one other place. That's where I got them, but not in this form. And so how did you... Uh, how did you st- find these you just went to a there was a, there was a book library? called the uh i think the book beautiful okay. pearson peterson and he had this as an appendix at the end okay. he was trying to get all of morris's writings but because these are basically from interviews it's a much softer morris mm-hmm. and there's a lot of humor in some of it and you can uh at least i can see that his mind was everywhere he really was a renaissance man you know, printing was the, the sum, if you like, of all his interests. But he was one hell of a good designer. His wallpapers are still beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had some very good ideas about architecture. He was trained as an architect. He's a much warmer person, I suspect, in some ways than uh, Cobb and Sanderson. But they were both, I think, fairly private people. And uh, that's often what's necessary to uh, get work done. So how did Morris inform what you've done with your life? Not that much. I mean, we all, I think, in the days when I started, way back in the 60s and 70s, we all wanted to fool around with type ornaments. And that's what I've always enjoyed doing. I'm less uh, talented at it now as I used to be. Mm -hmm. But I love the idea of ornament, the interlocking mathematical patterns that can be made. I have no mathematical sense at all, but I enjoy pattern and... uh, 
the challenge of doing something complicated with an ornament. Uh, but that's probably as far as Morris's visual things uh, influenced me. His big thing was the Middle Ages. Purity of the books of the Middle Ages, he probably wasn't that far off in his assessment, but it just became probably a little bit stultifying for some people uh, by about 1910. I think he was already becoming out, coming out of favor. Will Bradley in the States was very influenced by Morris. There were at least two or three versions of Morris's typeface available. A guy called Albert Hubbard. Yeah, Roycroft thought he was Morris. <laughs> <That's> it, <yeah. laughs> and tried to do rather precious books. Am None I? of which has lasted that well. No. But God bless him for trying it. Yes, yes. You know, that's what it's about. It's about trying. And if you don't make it, heck, you don't make it. Uh, he, uh, I love the fact that he went out and searched out all sorts of people and interviewed them. Oh, yes, a little yeah. home to these. Yeah. This uh, was a very uh, conscious effort to do that with a visit to William Morris. Mm -hmm. Because it is the idea of seeing the guy, talking to the guy, yep. getting that thing. I can only hope that the transcription of Morris's words was fairly accurate, but it certainly was. Yeah, the responses are certainly much part of the time. And I imagine that Morris talked quite a bit like that mm -hmm. with, as I say, some humor. Mm -hmm. He does a, no a great number on the German language, <laughs> which you wouldn't expect, and translation, trying to translate from German. And, uh, but most of the interview was about printing and type, and the books that he was going to do. That's where it became a little tricky, because the interviews were done at different times, and I suspect there's some chronological inaccuracy there. But, uh, you, you mentioned patterns. Uh, it puts me in mind of the Kerwin Press and those beautiful Oh, orders. yes. And uh, that, that Chris Van Elstead is planning a book on is, that. He is. I can't wait for, yeah. for that. But, I think it'll be quite exciting. I, I hope that it's as original as it can be because he's got some wonderful physical material to work with. And uh, any ornament, if you have one that's right reading and left reading, you can make tremendous patterns from them. And that can be very uh, useful. I'm going to reach over here and get another book, which I got out this morning and it, by mistake, thinking it was Cobb and Sanderson, and I didn't. And I'm sorry to be talking about it. So this is not quite a companion book, but it's uh, some essays on the private press. And I've tried in that to use uh, some patterns as much as I can. Oh, okay. So this is called Pressing Matters. Pressing Matters. And that... Uh, is a pun, if you like, and <laughs> can be uh, sure whatever you want. But uh, there was an opportunity here to uh, to play around with some patterns. It's basically a, a print, a, rep a reprint, a first printing of a manuscript on the definition of the private press by Leonard Barr, who ran the Adagio Press in Michigan many, many years ago. And he sent me a copy, and I've always wanted to do something. His friend Paul Dunsing was also a very, very fine private printer and typecaster. And here were these two guys. Paul was my, my mentor and my hero, and in a way, this is a kind of uh, homage to Paul. And uh, I asked Roland Milroy, who was a superlative printer, to contribute, and uh, then I, uh, I uh, finished the job with a, an yeah. afterward. And, and I see the binding is upside down. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a defect. On Sorry, this, on this one, only. on this one only. Yeah, yeah. you didn't see yeah. that. No, no. no. <laughs> uh, and so, okay, can you summarize what you're? This, after? this is exactly what I'm yes, talking about. Yes, yes. Using patterns around quotations, playing with color, playing with shapes, interlocking two interlocking designs. In the 18th century with Caslin, they really started to get into ornamentation. It's been a, it's been a useful adjunct. Uh, ornaments really started with book binding in the 15th century because type began pure, just like Cobb and Sanderson. But there's a good place for that, and it isn't done in printing, offset printing, or digital printing very much. There aren't very many ornaments around, so it's nice to have ornaments and borders. It's funny, this quote is by Arthur W. Rushmore. Um, Who had a press as well, as I recall. He did, and I just bought the bibliography to that press oh just a few gosh. days ago. 
Oh yeah. my gosh. Uh, Oak Knoll put a lot of effort, it looks like, into it. But yeah, huh. it's a nice coincidence. And so what did you say in your afterward? Can you summarize that for us? Oh, not a lot. Just uh, I think basically that uh, the private press is, in as we have known it, is probably on its way out. We probably don't need a specific definition, but the idea of printing for pleasure rather than profit, makes the private press slightly different from the uh, fine press, as I know it, mm. which pe in which people are, with very legitimate and fine reasons, are trying to make a little bit of money yep. from very good printing, or sometimes not quite very good printing. That's an um, interesting uh, differentiation, because I was, I was talking with uh, Sophie Schneiderman, who is a dealer that specializes in fine presses, and she... She defines a, a private press now as presses that were active around Morris's time and mm -hmm. fine presses as more, you know, the stuff that came after that period. Yeah, there's a very, there's a very gray line there, I think, and I don't pretend in any way to be an expert. Virginia and uh, Leonard Wolf had a private press. Yeah. It was not the most exciting typographic adventure, but uh, it really helped Virginia to focus on uh, uh, an activity. They fell totally in love with it. My wife is doing some research on uh, Virginia Woolf right now, so I'm getting some of the, uh, the good back stuff. Okay. And I know very little about the, the original Hogarth Press. Yeah. It became a separate publishing operation. The, I think the Nonsuch Press started also mm -hmm. as a pretty well-meaning private press but and continued really pr bringing the standards of clarity, legibility, simplicity that Cobden Sanderson started into the commercial world. Mm -hmm. I've had a few um, non-such press books over the years. I have a non-such Bible actually mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful, beautiful job. Mm -hmm. That's as late as I believe the 1950s or 60s. Yep. And I wouldn't consider it a private press, but it has every earmark of the best of the private press tradition. So it's, it, yeah, it's, it's a gray area. And uh, there was a lot of passion about making a good, well-margined page with a good, sturdy binding and taking pride in producing a really good book. So... Why do you think private presses are on the way out? Because well, I think, everyone's motivated to make money and not... No, 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 that, not at all. I, and I'm, I'm being far too snippy and uh, hypocritical there. But there are, there are groups of printers who really want to make good books, but they're also anxious to sell them at a good price. Mm -hmm. uh, the book fair that I was at yesterday was attended by someone, a binder whose work... I respect and whose personality I greatly admire and she was questioning some of my books because some of them sell for more than a hundred dollars to which I wanted to say yes but if I'm working on a book for 18 months and I'm getting the very best paper that I can and I've had to get some type all of this is very costly and I'm doing 40 copies so she was questioning that? Yeah, she's questioning the, the high cost of private press books. Uh, it's not something it's for every person. It's low cost when you consider the amount of effort and time you yeah, put into it. Yeah, you don't get paid for your effort. No. You don't get paid for your time. I hope the guys that, that really are what I call small press printers are able to make some money because it's, it's really dangerous. But you have to have those standards too. And sometimes I feel that, you know, the Aryan Press, I understand, is, is just quit in uh, San Francisco after 50 years. But they've been doing reprints of Dashiell Hammett or Raymond Chandler. Does the world need that? Uh, I think the mandate of the private press initially, and here is where I really admire Leonard and Virginia, they wanted to print work by their friends. They wanted to print their own work. Mm -hmm. They wanted to print poetry. And I think every press, private or otherwise, should get out there and do a broadside or two of poetry because it doesn't take long to set. Mm -hmm. It could be done on good paper. I mean, I spent ten my first ten years as a printer printing on whatever crappy off-cut paper I could get, and then somebody told me, "Look, if you're going to sell these, 
they've got to be good. They've got to be on decent paper. And that really was a wake-up call. My, there are a lot of things that I don't like about my books, including the paper. But at least the I early was, books, the early, well, some yeah. of the later books too. Okay. But at least I was trying. And uh, if I'm going to sell a book, I have to try to price it as well and as fairly as I can. Mm -hmm. I'm also trying to do things for twenty dollars because uh, it's still a private press book for me, and it may not be that uh, big an effort. I don't want to get into the the mercenary aspect of it or the financial. But I, as I say, reprinting a uh, and I'm not being a snob here, reprinting something that has been out of print for a long time that probably doesn't really need to come back and passing that off as a very fine press mm. edition is not fair. If you're going to use an illustrator, you got to pay him or her too. And that's where it can be really, really exciting because you can get some good reflection from the images that an artist creates. Well, isn't that what the Aryan press did with uh, Moby Dick and Barry yeah. Moser? And yeah, they had, and the early Barry Moser was just absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And then he became, frankly, rather commercial mm -hmm. and cranked out things like the Bible and a few other things, and they just lost that, that life and that spark. Mm -hmm. I think wood engraving is one of the most complementary media for text, but we also have to all remember that it's not about us. It is about the text. Mm -hmm. It starts from the text. It's like early Baroque opera. It starts from the text, and anything else is a fancy little addition. You know, when Monteverdi and some of his contemporaries started, they wanted to reflect the text, the drama, mm -hmm. and the music was incidental. And we know what happened after Mozart. <laughs> and now we're getting back into it because... Uh, there's some really good contemporary opera mm. that pays very close attention to the text. And uh, we're, we're making that swing. Getting back to this, I think, my again, being an old fart, I can say this. I don't use polymer plates very much, but I love and admire and respect anybody who can print from polymer plates. It does not have to be monotype. Uh, it does not have to be very carefully carved out wood blocks. Polymer plates, I think, are perfectly fine. Letterpress is still, to me, the ideal, but if you have to go digital or you have to uh, uh, do a little bit of offset, then you do it. As long as the book is, you know, comes out looking pretty damn good and it's worth the money that somebody has to pay for it. Is there someone whose work uh, today that you're really, really keen on? Oh, totally. Uh, my, my hero, who and he's been my hero for quite a while, is Roland Milroy. He thinks so carefully uh, at Heavenly Monkey about what he's going to do. He has a wide range of interests, and they show in his press work on an old Washington press with hand inking is so absolutely beautiful. And his bindings are good. He's he taught himself binding. Mm -hmm. He does beautiful work. The books are not cheap, but they are absolutely magnificent. There isn't one book that I've seen from Heavenly Monkey that is not uh, worth a penny less <laughs> than uh, what they cost. But it's the joy that uh, Roland has in finding. He, he has a rather peculiar approach, and then he's found some early books. Uh, at the moment, he's working on um, Kelmscott and Dove's Press. He has some pages from the Dove's Bible. They will be reissued with an essay by uh, Alfred Pollard. Mm -hmm. uh, the essay may not be quite as important as the pages within that, simply because I'm not sure that Pollard says that much, but he was close enough and he was in contact with Morris. And uh, the book will be absolutely gorgeous, I'm sure. Can you explain that, that he's got pages from... <laughs> he has pages from a, dispo from a disbound book or disbound books uh, of the Dove's Bible, and I don't know which comes got press book. And they will be tipped in. Tipped into? In, tipped into his, his book. I see. So and be, the format is quite large because the Dove's Bible pages are quite large. Okay. So and he's done that with other things. George Wither uh, did some emblem books in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. And he found some pages. And anybody who loves books will always be horrified at the idea of a book ripped apart and its pages sold. Mm -hmm. But it's not that Roland has started the fashion. The pages were available, and he bought them, and he's recycling them, if you like, in the most elegant and appropriate manner. 
and I would do exactly the same thing. In fact, I have some engravings, and I think I'm going to recycle them. <laughs> he did, he um, did exactly fair. that with the Reed's Leaves. That's right. Uh, Robert Reed's early uh, Who's Fans Manager. Yeah, yeah that was, they were unbound copies, mm -hmm. and uh, he finished the job, so to speak, with an introduction, and I think did nothing else to the book. But it's sort of nice to know that uh, Roland is contributing through Pollard to uh, Cobb and Sanderson and Morris, both are, are, of whom are heroes to all of us, I think, mm -hmm. and that the book will be available and you can actually own a page and you can look at it. Mm -hmm. You can check the impression, you can check uh, the quality of the paper because it's all handmade paper. I hope I'm not making a total fool of myself, Roland, if you listen to this. <laughs> it can be very exciting. And it makes uh, some of these books affordable to individuals and to libraries. Right. I saw a set that was, I think, put out in the 1930s at Massey College. There were leaves from manuscript uh, books mm -hmm. and I think early printed books. And someone obviously did a number in the 1930s. But yes, there they are. I had some pages of the Nuremberg Chronicle that I bought over the years, and I've just donated them to Massey College. And the Nuremberg Chronicle is a fairly common book, mm -hmm. but it's a hell of an exciting book. And so somebody can go into Massey College and see some of my pages, or pages from my collection, my Dutch great uncle's collection, because that's where some of them came from. Mm -hmm. Some of them are hand-colored. There's a lot to learn from the Nuremberg Chronicle. It was one of the, the most interesting early illustrated books. History of the world from uh, the beginning of time to 1493. And then they left some blank pages so you could keep it up to date. <laughs> they put Columbus discovering North America in there, did they? I don't think it made the grade. No, okay. I think that was probably on press at the time, <laughs> but I haven't checked. What else is at the Massey? Because like, your papers are there, right? Are they? Yeah, my quote unquote archive, which consists of a lot of. Uh, illegible scribbles and some attempts at uh, planning type ornament patterns with uh, <clears throat> an ink pad and an ornament and things like that are there and I've, I've donated a number of books including some private press books okay. from friends over the years and that's a good place I feel very confident mm -hmm. and in the fullness of time a lot of my type here will go and uh, uh, some equipment probably because the bibliographic room uh, uh, at Massey College is still pretty exciting. Well, they've got all sorts of presses there, haven't they? They have a number of presses. They have a is press. Is it working? Uh, They're all working yeah. presses. Okay. They also have a Vandercook press now, mm -hmm. which requires hand inking. Uh, I'm not that uh, careful <laughs> about hand inking. Mm -hmm. I have a, an automatic roller. But uh, they have one which requires hand inking, and they're printing broadsides, mm -hmm. and they've had some remarkably interesting broadsides. Students come in and they have a much better idea, I think, of the world of uh, bibliography. They're not in front of computers. This is the way books were done, so they're able to have a, uh, a take a whack at it. I think St. Michael's College also has a bibliographic room. And bear with me for a second. I just got this yesterday. There used to be a fine printing and books arts uh, laboratory at Carlton. There is to be one? There is to be one. They're starting it, mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. anxious to get equipment and mainly financial donations. Mm -hmm. uh, I think basically lead is dead. It's gone from a commercial uh, necessity to an art form, and everybody wants to print letterpress. Everybody wants to do Christmas cards. Everybody wants to do Aunt Sally's jam labels um, because it's exciting. It's exciting because what? It's very tactile. You it's very, it. very tactile. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you print uh, very carefully, you get what's called a kiss impression, mm -hmm. where the type sits on the page. If you have worn type, you get what's called the cardboard impression, where you really thump it in yeah. because that's the only way you can get uh, an impression. And most of our type is worn out, as I'm sure I told you, you know, six or seven years ago. So it's hard to get type, but the polymer plate will allow other possibilities, including calligraphy, drawings. I've, uh, as I say, I've used it on several occasions and I find it tricky, but uh, it's, uh, it's fine. Whatever works, the important thing is to do books, in my view, because uh, 
if you can hand, you know, if you can set 16 pages or more and survive the drudgery and the monotony, then you're a serious private printer. You don't have to be. You know, Aunt Sally's jam labels are fine. Yes. But uh, <laughs> I like the idea of longevity and endurance and mm-hmm. suffering. Paying for it. Paying for it. Yeah. Before we finish, why don't uh, I get you to read out some of those different quotes that you... Uh, From this, yeah. Oh, I'd be happy to. Where is the book? Yeah, maybe Where it's over there. There, there we, go. we go. Yeah, yeah so. there are some There are some views in here. Yeah. So well, this, this is Cobb and Sanderson. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to go then to the last, uh, the last entry. Uh, I should also say, in wanting to do this, in doing this, I wanted, in a way, to learn about Cobb and Sanderson by typesetting his words. That's a very uh, physical way of learning. It's a great physical way of learning it, yeah. yeah. Hold on a sec here. And how does that help you? It, uh, it helps you, me you be, remember? Yeah, he be, he, you become part of uh, what he is saying by making the words that he has already written. Mm-hmm. I think that's true of um, any text if you get involved in it. A very quick aside, there's a wonderful early English poem called The Seafarer. Anybody who's taken Anglo-Saxon knows the seafarer. I didn't until two years ago. Mm. And I read it, and I was terribly, terribly moved by it. Did, and, uh, uh, did Ezra Pound uh, translate Ezra that? Pound did yeah. a translation yeah. without knowing a lot about Anglo-Saxon. Mm-hmm. He also did medieval poetry without knowing a lot. He did Chinese, too, for that Oh, matter. he did everything. I looked at it and couldn't find any really good translations. There was one that was done by a late 19th century rector and there were so many words that did not connect and that you know their their seafarer is one of the most pure forms of poetry in the English language it's one of the earliest I think it goes back to the 8th century it may have been earlier it could have been one of these Homeric experiences where the poems or the ideas were passed on Mm -hmm. for centuries I think it would I think it was written for the first time in either the 8th or the early 9th century. Couldn't find anything that that I wanted to set. I took, with the help of an Anglo-Saxon scholar here, in little old Dundas, (laughs) modest, squeaky clean Dundas, there is an Anglo-Saxon scholar who was very good. I found five versions, and from those English versions, I made my own version, not knowing a word of the original, except you could almost feel at times, what was happening. And I printed that. Before I printed it, uh, my Anglo-Saxon scholar friend found another Anglo-Saxon scholar. They read my translation. They read the original, which they still remembered from university decades and decades before. And they said, there's nothing wrong with this. It's okay. You know, it does reflect the original. So that's what I printed. Sorry to get emotional, but it's a great, great poem because it does talk about Todd Cobden Sanderson's sense of the cosmos, the future, spirituality, Christianity creeping in, paganism still in existence. Yeah, it's great. How, how long is it? <laughs> Not very long. Um, I could get something out. Mm-hmm. And I tried to do some uh, line of cut illustrations, which are impossible. It was one of these technical challenges that didn't work. I'm not very happy, but some people are buying it. Um, I'm going to read a little bit, and I'll read as much as you can squeeze in. Read the, yeah, read what hits you most profoundly. Okay, I'll read two entries. Um, this is 19, bear with me, 1917. 28th of July, Saturday, 7 to 8 a.m. Last night I let the bus take me across the bridge. This is the Hammersmith Bridge. Mm. That I might that's have. Sorry, that's where he threw the type. That's off. where he threw the type, yeah. Let me start again. 1917. 28th July, Saturday, 7 to 8 a.m. Last night I let the bus take me across the bridge that I might have a view of the river. It was a most beautiful evening, and the pleasure of the walk back. I alighted on the other side, just beyond the bridge, and then turned in front of the glory of the West full of life still, yet not so bright as to eclipse the light of the stars in the, in the zenith, or of the young min, moon low down in the south. The river, too, was another heaven, full of light from the heaven above, and flooded from bank to bank. I stood upon the bridge, 
and I walked to and fro, and bethought me of the time when I had crossed and recrossed it in winter time, in the darkness, and as the buses brought protection through the type from the bridge to the river, then I lifted my thoughts to the wonder of the scene before me, full of an awful beauty, God's universe and man's joint creators. How wonderful! And my type, the dove's type, was part of it. And I'll do this last one. Uh, where are we? Which, uh, this is written after the, uh, the gang in the, in the shop gave him a surprise birthday party, his 80th birthday. The guys got together and wrote him a letter telling them how much they admired him and uh, hoped they, uh, he might be given the honor and pleasure of many more happy anniversaries. He really loved his staff. Mm. 1921, 22nd January, Saturday. After supper, I went into the workshop and looked around on the shelves and counted the books still unbound. Sarda Risardis, Coriolanus, Areopagetica, Lucrece. My head worked. All the press work seemed to have run to sand. The tide had withdrawn and had left them stranded and immovable. All which set my brain a smoke, and in the night it inflamed into dreams. I lit the lamp, got out of bed, and brought back a copy of my credo, and sought to recreate myself on its great lines, and expand to the greater limits of the cosmos. And not in vain, how should it be otherwise? And I believe and see that in life and sleep we are at one with the Earth's self. That's... That's what Cotton Sanderson does. It really makes you think. Mm -hmm. I'm nearing the end of my life. I hope to have a few more years. But the, uh, <clears throat> the positive quality of Cotton Sanderson is absolutely amazing. And, no, it really, it's, um, it's astonishing. What's astonishing is how moved you are by it uh, still. Um, printing an emotion is something that you don't think about when you're doing it. Mm. But uh, you can see from that entry how emotional Cobden Sanderson became. Um, I have printed his credo. That was a very early Cobden Sanderson book. And he really does, in his weird way, explain um, his philosophy. Uh, printing is such a personal thing that it can't be devoid of emotion. I have a lot of emotion when I choose a cloth when I think about a typeface, how is this going to affect the reader? Mm -hmm. How is it going to affect me? Uh, aside from the realities of have I got enough top type? How worn out is the type? But uh, what, what is the emotion? Is it love? Is oh, it, total love. It's love. Total love and I think um, a real responsibility to be faithful to the intent of the author, because mm. if you you can you can you know you can publish a book, you can print um, something, but you are connecting to um, an author, and if the author is long dead, and uh, you have that, it's even more a responsibility because you can't set uh, uh, Shakespeare and sans serif, and you can't uh, uh, futz around in any way. Um, you have to really pay attention to your connection and is it an absolutely sincere connection to the author? How can you best serve those words? Uh, this is not a something that gets cranked out. Does the emotion help you make the right decision, do you think? Or the emotion it, it comes with, with the decision comes the emotion. I see. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, uh, uh, it's... Uh, so many of these things are interlocked, but you can see that uh, I have to connect with the words of an author, mm. whether, you know, at the beginning, or it won't work, right. or I can't do it, and I don't do any work on commission, because I want that experience, I want that interaction, and I have to be the servant of the author. Mm. On that note, yeah. I want to reach in here and, and give you something, mm. because it's something I completely forgot about. Okay. I try reading this without emotion. If I can find the damn thing now. Oh, come on, come on. 
I have a suitcase with many zippers. Yeah. And they don't always work. Ah. Still working on it. Bear with me. I will find it. It will happen. It's just, if I don't have a copy here, ah. success. Ah, oh, great. I, uh, you're still running, eh? Yeah, but I'm gonna... I'll just explain this very quickly. Sure. Oh, isn't that beautiful? This is, uh, um, actually, there are two versions. This is a, a brochure, um, and it's Shakespeare. It's Shakespeare that is virtually unknown, because as you'll see from the colophon, um, this is uh, some work that Shakespeare did on a play called Sir Thomas More. He was already aware of the plight of immigrants, and he gave one of his characters, and I think it was Thomas More, these wonderful, wonderful lines. How would you like to be in the shoes of uh, the immigrant? How would you like to suffer? See what it's like. Apparently the play couldn't be published because there were a lot of immigrants in England and that would have caused a lot of trouble in court. So I don't think, Sir, I think Sir Thomas More has been published. These were scenes that, uh, lines that he wrote. There were two other, two or three other authors, as you, I think I mentioned. Uh, but as I say, this is, uh, these are Shakespeare's words, almost certainly. And I had the great pleasure of printing him. How could you not be emotional about that? And I made sure that every one of my American friends <laughs> got a copy of this. Well, and the British friends, too. And that's the what, British that's friends, That's what Brexit yeah. is about, really, yeah. in a way, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. it was also an opportunity to uh, set uh, the type in one of Jim Rimmer's uh, most beautiful typefaces. And what was that? Do you know what the name of it it's is? It's called Juliana Old Style. And it was, uh, I think, the first typeface that he cut... He cut it right on the metal piece itself, sort of designing as he went along. And it was a memorial to a daughter, his daughter who died. So there are a lot of connections. I can imagine the emotion that Jim had cutting his first typeface. So yeah, uh, I don't think that books that are made by hand are ever quite what they seem. It's not just a piece of paper and a bit of type. If we don't have the emotion... We really can't make the books, and we really shouldn't try. I feel that more strongly as I get older. <laughs> Can you tell books that have been made with emotion and not emotion or not? Can no, you? that no. would be very foolish, and I shouldn't say that. But no, no, but I think, I, mean, I think almost anyone who makes a book, almost any private printer, is aware that he's handling some pretty emotionally pretty potent stuff. Mm. Some For some people, I'm sure it's nothing, but I know that... Uh, Roland Milroy certainly has some feelings when he uh, when he works in his books. How how can you not? And is that why you do it to to experience that depth of emotion? I think that's something that I never expected when I started. Right. Yeah, it's, it it creeps up on you. I haven't ever, with one exception, I've never sat down and looked at all my books, but I'm at about a hundred and nine now, and some of them are very very un inconsequential books. And there are two that I've showed you that I think might stand the test of time. And there are so many things that I dislike about all of them. But yeah, they're your children, so of course you, uh, you have some emotion, mm -hmm. good and bad, about them. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts on uh, Cobden uh, Sanderson and your emotions about his words uh, and the words of those who have affected you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've been speaking to uh, Will Ruder, who is the proprietor of the Aliquando Press, in your workshop in Dundas, Ontario. Thanks again. Thank you very much for coming over.